Well, hello and good evening and welcome to episode 15 of Fracking Nightmare. Oh, it seems that uh, I haven't moved very far. 45 minutes ago, of course, I was just closing out episode two of Humanity versus Insanity, the Crane Report. So for those of you who are uh, tuned in just for Fracking Nightmare, if you want to see a discussion on some wider issues, then try and find Humanity versus Insanity, the Crane Report. And uh, hopefully you'll have more success than I did because it seems that Google are actually hiding the first edition of Humanity versus Insanity. Perhaps um, somebody had a word in Google's ear and didn't like the fact that uh, we were doing an expose of the reframing of British policing. Fracking Nightmare, of course, will focus on issues directly related to fracking. But over the past year or so, I've received a lot of emails and telephone calls from people asking why I'm not commenting on the wider issues, which of course were my forte for the previous decade or so. And that's where Humanity versus Insanity, the Crane Report, comes in. So, on a Monday evening, Humanity versus Insanity will go out at 7.15. Then they will be followed by a, a repeat of the UK Column Daily News. And then at 9 o'clock will be Fracking Nightmare. But of course, all the shows will be available on YouTube immediately afterwards, if you can find them. Now, the intention is that these shows not only provide for a record, i.e. a repository of information that people can use as time progresses, but also to share, to spread around, to get people to comprehend the magnitude of the threat that the hydraulic fracturing agenda brings, not just to the UK, but right now, right across the planet. But we've got to act local, think global, but act local. And we have to start by trying to stop this abomination from manifesting in the UK. And 2013 saw the UK anti-fracking community achieve a 100% track record. We are, in fact, quite possibly one of the most effective anti-fracking communities on the planet. Although, unfortunately, we have to acknowledge the success of the French anti-fracking community, where France has effectively established a ban on the process, a ban that was upheld in the French high courts last October. Now we need to achieve something similar here in the UK before we end up in the same mess and witnessing the same devastation as that of people in the US, in Canada, Australia, and elsewhere in the world where this process has been unleashed. Now, before I get on to the uh, update of uh, what's been going on, particularly at Barton Moss, I want to mention the uh, conference that I uh, introduced on Humanity versus Insanity. This is going to be the theme of the Alternative View 5. Um, the first four were held between 2008 and 2010. So this will be the first Alternative View conference for four years. And it is timed to be exactly one year prior to the next UK general election. So in addition to a range of subjects being discussed, one of which of course will be hydraulic fracturing, but there will be a broad range of subjects, but also we'll be looking to launch a new political initiative. Now that's not to suggest that we have any chance of establishing a alternative government, but nonetheless, we have an opportunity to maybe introduce a thorn in the side of the orthodox political system. Something that comes at them from right out of the left field. So, unfortunately it's not a, a cheap event, but it is an all-inclusive event. From the Friday night on uh, May the 16th, in fact, until Monday morning on the, uh, on the 18th. So all meals, dinner, breakfast, lunch, and all teas and coffees are included in the residential price. Now, if you want more details on that, please go to the website, which is www.alternativeview.co.uk. Now, places are limited, and we are reaching out to people who have the motivation to make a real difference. This will be a conference that brings together the talents of the people and looking at a way in which we can bring about some very serious change, the changes that we all know we need to see. 
Now, fracking. What's been going on at Barton Moss? Well, I had to leave Barton Moss for the first time in almost a month uh, last uh, Wednesday. Uh, take a few days to catch up on some stuff in the material world, as it were. Uh, but uh, in my absence, events still continue to progress at a phenomenal rate. And we've seen a very significant change in the behavior of the police. Now, this started about 10 days ago when the police literally failed to turn up. Whether or not their alarm clocks collectively failed that morning, I doubt. It was an experiment to see what would happen if they left the convoy entirely at the hands of the protection community. And no doubt they suspected that the protectors would climb all over their trucks and block the road and the TAU unit would have to be called out in force. And no doubt Sir Peter Fahey, the Chief Constable of Manchester, was going to use that as an excuse to tell Westminster that he needed additional resources, that he needed to ask for an additional £10 from all Greater Manchester uh, taxpayers to pay for the additional funding of police at Barton Moss and elsewhere that I guess tried to get their bits in the ground. But it didn't work out that way because the protectors escorted the trucks to the gates in about two hours or so, and the same on the way out. The following day, there was a, a nominal police presence. But it's a game of cat and mouse. It's a game of chess. And of course, the reality is that the purpose of the Barton Moss Protection Community isn't just to block the trucks. It is to be a massive inconvenience to IGAS. In fact, one of the terms that uh, I, I very much like is investor removal team. This is a play, of course, on the police protector removal team. But the investor removal team is effectively what the Barton Moss community have become, because their challenge is to get the word out to the investment community that to put your money into this insidious industry is going to be extremely high risk. And if you actually take a look at what the iGas stock price is doing, then you'll see that it's fallen quite significantly from its artificial high in the immediate aftermath of uh, David Cameron announcing that uh, he was going to uh, give 100% of the business rates to the local uh, councils, and also that Total were buying in to the UK shale gas industry, having, of course, been banned from practicing in France. Now, on Friday of uh, last week, the protectors decided that it was time to get back into lock-on mode. So let's just take a look at this short video and uh, see a little bit of the preparation for the lock-on last Friday. We've got some mats in the geo zone coming. You're only sitting in that puddle here. Yeah. Oh, wait. Yeah, I'm going to go I'll obviously ask you the question. Are you willing to stand up and move? No. That's alright, I have to ask the question as you will. We're not blocking the foot path. We'll come up here and we'll walk off. We comprehend you, but we don't stand under you. I have to ask as you well know. Excuse me, here. CJ. CJ. Just being obvious, uh, Salford Online, what exactly are you doing now? <laughs> <laughs> We're locking on the people. Moss. 
protecting the people, protecting the earth, protecting the water, protecting the locals, protecting everybody basically. Um, we're sick of liaison with the police, the police liaison does nothing, we, we have conversations with the police liaison, it doesn't stop the brutality, it doesn't stop the arrests, it doesn't stop the facilitating of illegal sort of eye gas coming in, um, basically polluting the water system. Drilling. No, that's good, that's good. Yeah, I'm doubled on my ass anyway. Okay, so basically, no matter how many conversations we have with the police, no matter how many times they pretend to be our friends, they still continue to sort of like bully us and uh, facilitate incorrect protests, telling us that we need to move forward when we are moving forward, pushing us. Um, yeah, basically, we just need to stop the lorries for a little bit today just to. Uh, so, yeah. Well, and to let them know the that we're not going to be the new police walking their lorries down the road. Yeah. Came to blockade. Cameron on in Now, this is, of course, direct action. It is peaceful protest. Now, the protester removal team eventually came along, but uh, they left the four people stuck in their tubes there for about a couple of hours before actually wandering up the road to take a look at the situation. They took a look and then wandered off, deciding that they were going to leave the protectors to their predicament. And in fact, they left them there for nearly five hours. Now, this is you know, really, truly remarkable. And I think we have to acknowledge the fortitude and the stamina and the commitment and conviction of those protectors in being there for five hours. Imagine your arms in those tubes. You can't reach out, you can't scratch your nose, you can't take care of normal business, you're stuck in the tubes. Previously, the police have come along with the protector removal team and cut the protectors apart after about two to three hours. This time, it's over five hours. Now, by the time they were, they were cut out, I think they were probably uh, looking forward to uh, um, being arrested. And of course, they were taken to the police station and then went through due process and of course were released or forced out of the police station with police bail conditions, which once again restricted them from returning to the camp. But the police should now know the form because the standard practice is to go back to the camp to get rearrested so that the police have to take you to the magistrate's court and the magistrates are consistent in releasing the protectors and stating categorically that they will not deny the protectors the right to protest. In fact, the police and the Crown Prosecution Service have effectively instructed the police, I'll use that term loosely, to revise their arrest strategy, which of course may account for the no police days. And when there is no police, guess what? There's no arrests. But uh, the police obviously feel they have to justify the uh, million pounds or close on million pounds that they have supposedly spent on the policing operation. Although it has to be said that it's very clear that Manchester Police and West Sussex Police have very different systems of accounting. The Barton Moss campaign has now been running longer than the Balkan blockade. Yet the Manchester police claim that their spend to date is around about £1 million, whereas the West Sussex police claim that their spend for a 66-day campaign was £3 million. So I'm guessing that there's a little bit of inconsistency in the method by which they calculate the payments. Either that or West Sussex Police are paid one hell of a lot more than their, their colleagues in Greater Manchester. Now let's go back to Sir Peter Fahey. Here he is, this is uh, Sir Peter Fahey uh, with uh, all the brass on his shoulders. This is the Chief Constable of the Greater Manchester Police. Right, we'll move that uh, from the screen a second because I want to just take the opportunity to quote Sir Peter Fahey. Because he says, we appreciate the strength of feeling of the protesters and that drilling for gas is a matter of national debate. Thank you. It should be a matter of national debate. Thank you, Sir Peter Fahey, for pointing that out. Because David Cameron 
and his other cronies of Lord John Brown seem to somewhat ignore that fact. They are not prepared to participate in debate. They want to railroad this or bribe the population into accepting this abomination in their backyards. He continues, we deal with many protests in Greater Manchester and always try to negotiate an understanding which facilitates protest, which is a basic human right. Right again. On the other hand, we are disappointed that some at the site constantly try and provoke officers and are personally insulting to them. We will continue to expect the highest standards of restraint and patience from our officers, but also ask the public to appreciate the difficult position they have been put in. So it seems, Sir Peter Fahey, that once again, the Manchester police hierarchy are reliant on hearsay information from the police on the ground. Now, you have evidence gatherers crawling all over the protection community. The video footage will, of course, ultimately ensure that all, well, most of the arrests that have occurred to date are effectively thrown out when they come to court because the video evidence will demonstrate that those arrests do not in any way, shape or form comply with the Crown Prosecution Service guidelines for arrests at peaceful protest. Now, we readily acknowledge, and in fact, we have the video evidence to prove it, that your inspectors on the ground state, with one exception, that they do not follow the guidelines of the Crown Prosecution Service. They follow the guidelines of that private organisation known as the Association of Chief Police Officers. And it would seem that the Association of Chief Police Officers, the Crown Prosecution Service and the judiciary are at loggerheads over what constitutes an appropriate arrest at a peaceful protest. Now, to date, of course, we've had the fallacious allegations of a flare being fired at a police helicopter, not a single shred of evidence, despite freedom of information requests being submitted, has been released to even demonstrate that there was due cause for making that allegation. Not to mention, of course, that it took three days for the police to actually turn up at Barton Moss uh, to search the protectors' tents. And of course, I was actually away from the camp on that particular day, and I had the pleasure of watching Plod pace through my tent, failing to recognise that it's a boot-free zone, so thanks for all the footprints over my carpet, and watching them search my tent for 20 minutes. And then, of course, leave me a receipt to say that they had taken nothing. Well, of course not, because you found nothing. Likewise, in the rest of the tents in the camp. So, once again, the war of words is played out in the media as Sir Peter Fahey and the Gold Command, Chief Superintendent Mark Roberts, attempt to demonstrate that there is some justification for assigning over 100 police officers each day for a peaceful protest that is generally made up of about 25, 30 people, many of whom are from the local community. So, Sir Peter Fahey, we ask once again that you produce the video evidence to support your allegations that uh, members of the protection community um, are trying to provoke officers and personally insulting to them because that is not my experience. And I have literally hundreds of hours of video footage, as do other filmmakers at Barton Moss. And suffice to say, the only evidence that we have of any kind of aggression is primarily from Greater Manchester Police's TAU. The general demeanor of the normal police has been Exemplary. There are a few exceptions, of course, but generally it's been exemplary. But once the TAU are unleashed, the whole demeanour has changed. I must have said that a dozen times over the past weeks and nothing changes. Except, of course, when the TAU are kept in their cages and then the protest has more chance of being truly peaceful. But let's come back to the point that you made, Sir Peter Fahey. It is a matter for national debate with 64% of the country now up for grabs 
thanks to David Cameron and Michael Fallon trying to rush this agenda into the UK before people fully realise the magnitude of the threat. It is a matter of national debate and it's about time we have that national debate and until such time as that debate takes place, then what is happening at Barton Moss will be replicated anywhere in this country where the mother frackers try and get their bits in the ground. I'll see you in part two. Sixty percent of the English countryside is under threat from fracking, a process which has transformed the landscape in many parts of the United States and Australia and contaminated the drinking water and air with highly toxic chemicals and gases. One in three hydraulic fracturing was using a carcinogen. So it really is a chemical cocktail that goes into the earth, of which up to 40% remains there. The grandchildren were in the bath and they started screaming and everything that was in the water was burnt. The MDs have been instructed not to report any negative health effects that they believe to be associated with living over a gas field. There's nothing inherent about the shale gas process that is going to lead to problems. Some of this material was actually taken to a large sewage treatment works, which had no capacity to handle radioactive materials of this kind. 800,000 gallons was dumped into the Manchester Ship Canal. 50 seismic events were recorded during just six fracking treatments. What is the minimum depth that the fracking will fracture? We can't tell you until we drill the excavation. Have you no idea whatsoever? Because it doesn't look like you've done your research. Shale gas is part of the future and we will make it happen. We are just numbers and we are sat on this rich vein of gas and they will do and say anything to get that gas out of the ground. And welcome back to part two of Fracking Nightmare, episode 15. Now today at Barton Moss, today, unfortunately, was quite possibly the day of the largest number of arrests at Barton Moss. Now, uh, five, I believe, um, of those arrests, I'm still waiting for a final update on the situation, but I believe five of those arrests were by people who specifically elected to sit at the entrance of Barton Moss Road and refused to move. Now, at least two of those were deliberately trying to get rearrested so that they could get their bail conditions lifted because they had been arrested, given the usual uh, uh, bail conditions by the police, which, of course, they need to go back to the magistrate to be able to get lifted. It's a farce. It's a complete and utter farce. But it's a charade that Manchester police want to play out because it helps their statistics so that when they go to the media, they can say we've had 110 or 120 arrests, failing to um, obviously acknowledge the fact that it, actually it's about 35, 40 people. Um, and many of the arrests are re-arrests. I think the person who's had the most arrests right now has had about seven. Um, and most of those cases will, of course, most of those charges will be dropped once they actually come before the courts. So... Having blocked the road, then there were clearly a few more arrests as the convoy was walked in. But it was a slow walk and uh, the total, I think, was somewhere around about three hours. But the total number of arrests was 10 arrests. But this is also having a very significant impact in terms of the local community. Because as the people of Earlham and Caddishead become increasingly aware... Here we go. This is... Uh, the Earlham and Caddy said contingent at the rally a couple of weeks ago. Considering this is a group, this is the local community, but this is a group that didn't exist just four weeks ago. And it's now quite possibly one of the fastest growing anti-fracking uh, groups in the country. As people in the immediate vicinity of Barton Moss actually begin to realise the magnitude of the atrocity that is about to be perpetrated, it literally in their backyards. Not only that, but in an area of outstanding natural beauty, i.e. 
the Mosses. So it's having the effect. As I said to the police a couple of days ago, you know, when the TAU are kept in their cages, when the police are kept off the line, there is peaceful protest and it, everything goes swimmingly. But the downside of that is perhaps that we don't get the publicity. So the only acknowledgement to the police is that every time you behave in this way, then it ensures that the anti-fracking campaign gets publicity that it probably wouldn't achieve on its own. So it's a real double-edged sword. And my hat is off to all of the protectors who take the decision to sit or stand on, in front of the trucks or climb on the trucks because they are doing it due to their conviction, due to their own research, due to their own realization of what this process will do if it is permitted to get started in this country. Now, one of the guys that um, is uh, doing a wonderful job in terms of researching into the deeper um, levels of what's behind this agenda is Bear. Bear was, of course, with us last week. And um, unfortunately, uh, we suffered a few sound problems uh, last week, Bear. There was a bit of a, an issue with the lip sync, but um, the audio, I think, was OK. So last week we were talking about the outrageous reports that are being requoted by government uh, regarding um, air pollution, air contamination, and showing that in reality there's no substance behind those uh, reports whatsoever. And I think um, today we're going to be uh, talking about um, radon. Yeah, that's right, Ian. Um, it's the same thing that happened really with the report last week that I did is that once again, once I've started scratching the surface, it's become you know, horrifyingly aware to me that how little, once again, data there is actually out there. Now, um, you wanted to show us uh, this map, because this is the map that our regular viewers will be familiar with. The, the green, of course, being the area of the country that is, is now up for grabs. And the, the brown are the areas that are already licensed. Yeah, that's correct. One of the reasons I wanted to show this map was just to give people an idea of the projected ranges of where the fracking is going to happen. But also it will be very helpful to get an understanding of the link between the geological units that they're going to be fracking and the emission of radon, which is what I'm going to talk about further on as we go along. OK, now just before we get on to the radon, I just want to uh, take the opportunity uh, with that map. So uh, if we can bring that map back up, because all of the red asterisks on that map are the areas that have been designated as potential targets for fracking's ugly sister, um, underground coal gasification. And there was, uh, of course, a short piece on underground coal gasification in, in last week's show uh, after I visited the, um, uh, the community at West Kirby on the Wirral, who are now looking to uh, establish a community group to challenge Clough Industries who, who want to get into underground coal gasification. But if we look at those asterisks, you know, if we look, it's um, you know, to the uh, east of Edinburgh, um, in the Firth of the Forth there, all down the Northumberland and North Yorkshire coasts, um, you know, right, right down, uh, almost, the, well, right down through to Lincolnshire, off the coast of Norfolk, off the coast of Essex, and, um, of course, uh, uh, South Wales, in fact, I'm going to be uh, holding an event in Ammonford in uh, South Wales on the, I think it's the 14th of March, details on my website. And then, of course, up through the, uh, the Solway Firth and uh, the Wirral. So underground coal gasification, we haven't, um, I haven't put too much emphasis on uh, this issue uh, in the recent editions of Fracking Nightmare. But uh, in, a, in a future edition, we're going to focus specifically on underground coal gasification, and we're going to look at the magnitude of problems and disasters that underground coal gasification has caused around the country, but to, around the world rather. But today, we're going to uh, focus on radon. So over to you, Bear. All right, thank you, Ian. Right, well, um, as I said, last week I dealt more, more specifically with the air emissions, and one, I'm, I'm mainly doing my research about the potential of groundwater. Um, contamination. But as I'm going along, I'm finding all the really interesting information and reports, or lack thereof, in other different areas. Now, for those that don't know, radon, it's a radioactive, colourless, odourless, tasteless gas, 
and this occurs naturally as a product of radium, which is present in most of the Earth's crust, radioactive isotope. Um, it's one of the densest substances that can remain a gas under normal conditions, and it's considered to be a health hazard due to its radioactivity. Now, radon is present in almost all natural gas, such as shale gas, but amounts are almost impossible to calculate, mainly as it varies due to different geology and depth. Now, radon is also a highly mobile gas, and it may migrate over large distances before it decays, thus posing a potential health risk, especially where it collects in buildings. I'm sure quite a few people, the viewers, will have heard about these problems before. In fact, um, Bear, let me just say, I mean, if we look at this map here um, mm -hmm. that you sent over to me, and uh, this shows the, um, the magnitude of the radon deposits across the country. But I live down in the southwest of England. And um, when I first moved down to Devon, the, mm -hmm. the property that I purchased, um, which was a redeveloped barn, but one of the requirements of that barn was that it had a radon sink. Can you, can mm. you explain to the viewers what the radon sink is all about, Bear? Basically, as I've said, radon is one of the densest substances that can remain a gas, so it will naturally migrate upwards. But if you create a radon sink, that allows somewhere for this potentially dangerous gas to collect. And because ra a radon has a relatively short half-life of only about four days, that allows it to decay quickly and obviously neutralize itself. So in any area, that, if, you, if you know that you have radon in your area, especially a lot of new builds, these are mandated to be put in basically just to maintain the minimum risk to human health um, in these areas. Is. So what's the, what's the um, additional risk of radon contamination if the uh, shale gas industry kicks off in this country? Right, well, I'm just going to, um, basically, I'll, um, I'll deal a bit more with the radon and then I'll get straight into that okay. part of it. Right, exposure to natural sources, uh, people may have heard this acronym before, NORM, normal uh, radioactive uh, background radiation contributes approximately 84% of the average annual dose of radiation to the public. So that basically means that around us there are natural sources of radiation that we're constantly bombarded with that are very low level and, very, and have very minimal health impacts. Um, but of these, this is why radon is quite dangerous, is that of these sources, 50% of this comes from radon. So essentially 42% 40, um, of all the radiation from background radiation you receive per year is from radon within buildings, so even in your own home. Now, it's very important to consider the effect of radon when looking into the shale gas industry, mainly because it is the second highest cause of lung cancer after smoking, and it's currently estimated to kill around 2,000 people in the UK alone. Now, Figures given for the average um, dosage you'll get from your domestic gas supply, and, you know, this is surprising, but there is actually radiation in every gas supply you have, be it coming from a pipe through the wall or be it through, you know, cylinders of propane or butane. But um, the, it's a very small amount. It's only around, <coughs> excuse me, only around four microsieverts, 200 becquerels, which in terms of radiation is a very, very mineral dose, but it is still there. Now, once again, this is where we get into the worrying lack of information um, and studies as I was trying to do research into this. As it stands, there are currently no models or studies have been created to understand the impact of shale gas on, um, in the UK. The only place you can really get information again from, one, once again, is the US, which is a problem because it's non-comparable. Even though you can take these studies, it doesn't actually allow you to understand it. Over here, it's not an, it's not an analogy. It's simply taking information from somewhere where this problem is occurring. Now, um, in the US, they found that the Marcellus Shale, now for those that don't know, the Marcellus Shale is the black shale, very similar to the Boland Shale, which is the main reservoir rock for methane in the eastern US, so where they're extracting places like Pennsylvania. And this was found to contain, as most shales are, with high levels of radioactive contaminants, or, well, in this case, just radioactive materials. Um, now, once again, there's been very few physical studies done or conducted until recently. Um, so uh, the only one I've been able to find conclusively looking at this issue in shale gas or in any form of um, you know, direct hydrocarbon fra shale, uh, hydraulic fracturing was from last year um, and 2012, um, which means that there's been over a decade of extraction in the U.S. with no understanding of the potentials of this hazard. Now, the, um, the concentration of radon gas is ultimately determined by how much radioactive material is in the reservoir rock. And in this case, it has been proven both the Marcellus Shale and the Boland Shale are known as high-end radioactive you know, um, carriers. So there's a potential there. And also interesting, something I found out from the study that I looked at, as I say, this one study that was uh, done in 2012-13, Rowan and Kramer, um, was that 
in conventional gas fields, there is less likelihood of radioactive contaminants or, radi- or less amounts, rather, of radiation being brought to per- pressure as there is in low-pressure reservoirs, such as shale-, shale gas. So, essentially, this type of technology is guaranteed to liberate more radiation because of the nature of the technology they're using. Now, as I say, with this, uh, the air emission study I cited last week, this study calls, once again, this Ronan and Kramer study, for more data because they only sampled 11 wells of the entire Marcellus Shale area. And I know you, Ian, can understand that that is such a tiny amount to be able to actually try and build up any understanding of this. Well, uh, over, over um, a million wells in the US have now been drilled and fracked uh, over the past two decades, most in the last decade. So 11 in a million is um, a very, very small percentage. Isn't it just? And as I say, this is the industry or independent, tr- uh, independent studies trying to verify or understand this data. And I mean, the funding, the lack of funding, the lack of care, the thought that must be coming from a lot of the American authorities, even though they claim to have done studies. I mean, once you start digging, you know, it, you just, it is, as I say, scary at what little has been done. Well, you know, call me, now, call me a cynic, but I wouldn't be at all surprised <laughs> if they, uh, you, you think I'm not? <laughs> Um, call me a cynic, but it, I mean, it would, just wouldn't surprise me at all if uh, the only reason that 11 wells were used in the sample survey is because out of the many, many, many wells they analysed, they could only actually come up with 11 that gave them the results they wanted. Oh, that sounds very, very plausible, to be honest, Ian, at the end of the day. But, I mean, it, you, we both said before, well, you said before, and I, we said last week, that many times that the industry will buy academia or exactly. take selective reports, you know, and they will always try and fit it to suit, which is another reason why industry-based monitoring is such a terrifying prospect, because realistically, they're just going to emit so much data. As I said last week, with the, with the fugitive emissions from uh, the compressor plants, only the top 20 have to be taken, where the 90 smaller compressor stations are completely ignored even though they know they produce as much hydrogen um, oxide and and nitrogen oxide sorry as the main ones exactly so anyway as i was saying with this uh with the uh the uh the study they even though it's only one study looking at 11 wells they've still used this to calculate the potential risk to the uk even though once again this study says that it can't be applied beyond the geographical boundaries of of, of it because as i said earlier the, the radon varies so much dependent on the, uh, the local geology, that you can't really attribute any studies done anywhere else to each individual fracking well. But um, what they've looked at, and this is something that need, you know, I think is quite uh, pertinent, is that, as I said, that there's already radon in domestic gas supplies. If they start using um, shale gas supplies, because Britain is so small and so densely populated, that means that that gas, once it's taken, taken to the compressor, then to the um, refinery where they'll basically produce it and create, they'll um, refine it for domestic or commercial use. It's going to be in our homes and our businesses a lot sooner than any other gas um, reserves we're currently using. And so even though it's only got a short half-life, as I said, of about four days, it's 3.8 days roughly, there's a definite potential increase for radiation in our homes. And this study used, um, the, it was from the public health education study, which I, I mentioned last week. They've used a high-end figure, which is quite impressive, rather than going for the smaller end. But um, that's approximately 2,900 becquerels. So as I said earlier, you know, like 200 becquerels is the average in our domestic supply. This is over 10 times greater. This would increase the potential radiation that we would receive up to 60 microsieverts a year. Now, I must state as well, in and of itself, that isn't actually that dangerous to public health. But if this is continual... That is, uh, this is one of the major problems of radiation. It's a slow killer, mm. for want of a better way to describe it. You know, it's the saturation over time. And also, with a potential increase in radiation from other areas, like contamination of groundwater, and, the ra- and almost all the equipment that's down, down hole, down the boreholes, is in some way going to be contaminated. The drill strings, the drill bits. And the radiation in the environment around us, and that's where the great worry comes from, is that they're basically increasing the radiation level across the board, potentially across the, our entire environment. So Bear, I mean at the moment of course um, once the drill string comes out of the hole um, and basically once the operation, the drilling operation is over, I mean in the US and in Canada and Australia the um, the used uh, drill pipe is transported through a wilderness but in this country that used drill pipe which will have 
radioactivity because of where it's been, basically. And, and that drill pipe is going to be transported right through the heart of many communities in this country as it returns to depot. That is exactly right. And th this is the, the great fear is that, as I've said, that you can't apply the studies in the US because most of those fracking sites are in the middle of nowhere, vast expanses of open territory, which in my opinion is bad enough to environmental damage done to those beautiful uh, bases, as you say. Um, but here, it's going to be, they, there's no other place that they can transport it, you know, there's no other, there's nowhere else. It's going to have to come through population centres, once again, increasing the potential risk to the public. Because at the end of the day, as we've said, if this is industry maintained, we've already seen evidence of chemical leaks at Barton Moss, which have been tried to be reported by the protectors to the police, who've basically ignored them. I mean, I think one quote I saw on one video was, you need to report it to the authorities. As somebody pointed out, aren't you the authorities? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, yeah. is, it is absurd. And of course, the, um, the robust regulatory controls, as we know, don't exist. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, it's incredible. Isn't it? Every time you hear any politician or anybody in the industry mention the word robust, you know that it's actually anything but. But uh, because Indeed. there is no experience of this industry, and it is in the UK uh, an embryonic industry, so we have no uh, regulations, no, we have no controls. So anything that comes out of the uh, out of the ground and of course if the i mean at barton moss it's a ten and a half thousand feet well uh which means that there is going to be in excess of a thousand pieces of drill pipe um half of that is going to be in the shale so that's 500 pieces of drill pipe that will come out of the well there and then be transported down barton moss road um down through the communities of either earlham caddishead or Eccles before it gets on the on the motorway uh, and even then, of course, but, uh, it, it's still effectively potentially radioactive because there is no requirement to test for radioactivity at the well site before that drill pipe leaves the gates. Yeah, completely correct, Ian. I mean, it's actually quite disturbing, some of the stuff I looked at. Um, it's known for many years in the hydrocarbon industry that they do liberate radioactive materials through any, almost every process from petroleum gas or have you like that. Um, but I was looking and finding that, um, uh, on average, workers who work in the hydrocarbon industry can look to have an increased radiation dose from tens of microsieverts up to hundreds of micro sievers. So the potential there at the wellhead is greatly increased for radiation exposure. And that in turn, because that equipment's got to go somewhere, is going to be put onto the public, onto the local environment. Because, you know, as I say, radiation is this slow and invisible killer. Well, because there Every are no the... studies. I mean, and this is exactly. the, there are yeah. no studies. Um, and the industry does not want to, of course, in, engage anyone to conduct this research. But um, I mean, I call it a hunch. But um, I would anticipate that uh, the life expectancy of somebody operating a pump on a frack crew, um, just the same as a deckhand, uh, basically is not going to be that long. I mean, the average life expectancy, the actuarial calculation of the life expectancy of a male in this country, I believe, is uh, 74 um, and for a woman, 79. Uh, it would be very interesting to see what the average life expectancy is of people who are literally at the front end of this industry, because I don't think it's going to be 74. No, I agree. And I'd also be very interested to know if and most of them were actually aware of the actual potential risks they're facing, because they may be aware of the chemicals, but I wonder, as they're not testing at the wellhead, do they even let them know that that potential is there? Because to be fair, a lot of the people, the roughnecks, the you know, the people working on the platforms, don't have that much in-depth geological knowledge. They're there more with their technical specifics for running the, dri exactly. the drill rigs. That yeah, there'll be one well site geologist who'll be directing them and where they're going, and maybe a logger or some geophysicists as well. But most of those guys, they're purely there, as you know, working in a mechanical sense rather than actually in a geological sense. Well, as we discussed last week, I mean, this is, you know, the behavioural adjustment payments, you know, the coefficients that are applied on top of base salary to get people to do jobs that uh, are not necessarily in, in their own best interests. Oh, indeed, indeed. Uh, it always did make me wonder why the potential pay, uh, pay was so high for working in the industry. And now, I, the more I look into it, I am so glad that well, I decided against and, it. And the life insurance payments as well, oh, God, because yeah, that, that's, yeah. of course, how the industry buys silence of the, uh, the relatives. And you know, in my opinion, I mean, the, the highest risk, I mean, we know that obviously driving um, is uh, high risk in the oil industry. I mean, as it is in, uh, in any profession. But uh, once, uh, once you actually get to the well site, um, I'm guessing 
but I'm, and I would love to see uh, some analysis on the subject, but I'm guessing that uh, the life expectancy of people working in frat crews, uh, as well as the deckhands, is not that high. Yeah, I'd expect that to be true, to be honest. Also, as well, I mean, just as an aside, not directly to the, the, the radiation or the poisoning from chemicals or anything like that, but also I know a lot of people who are in the industry, and a lot of them, so, you know, mentally, it's a very harsh lifestyle, very isolated in certain senses, especially if you're working offshore or working some of the harsher environments, somewhere like on northern Russia, Alaska. around the deserts in the Middle East. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of my, you know, I've met a lot of friends who have been, I can, you know, there's no other way to say it, but almost mentally traumatized by working in the industry because the push and the drive is there to succeed so much is to create you know is to create money and profits as fast and as rapidly as possible to meet this ever escalating demand for fossil fuels exactly and of course in fact um, I just want to show this um, this uh, graphic here because you were talking about the Marcella shale play mm -hmm. and um, if we can see this here we'll see that I mean the the US oil and gas industry stayed away from the Marcellus for as long as possible because Obviously, um, Pennsylvania in particular, which is at the heart of the Marcellus, is more densely populated than the areas in the western U.S. But um, five years ago or so, the oil and gas industry could no longer resist and, and went for the Marcellus. Um, and, of course, even Pennsylvania is still a lot less densely populated than any area of the, uh, the U.K. where the mother frackers mm. want to get their bits in the ground. Yeah, totally. And yeah, it's, this is the thing, you know, once again, it's that, as I say, these studies can't be comparable, you know, that, that you've got to take them on the, the um, geological, but also the environmental and geographical and topo topographical features in those areas, you know, exactly. prevailing winds, you know, the, the actual water systems, ecosystems, you know, that over there, it's such a devastating problem. But here, these problems, I feel, would be 10, 100 times worse, maybe, just because of the densely populated nature of Britain. Exactly. Now, we've got a map here which um, shows the, uh, the radon spread across the UK. And, uh, of course, we're, going to, we're talking specifically at the moment about the, uh, the Boland Shale area right across the country in the north there. Yeah, I mean, uh, from that, from the earlier map, you can see there's almost like the strip that runs down across the middle towards the wash yeah. from the uh, Seven Estuary. And is that Seven Estuary? Oh, my yeah, that's a Seven Estuary, sure. yeah. 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 And that strip that goes up the centre, essentially on the Pennines, that's the major range of the Boland Shale. So there can be seen to be a direct correlated link between these black shales, which are the second best source of radon after granites, um, and the radon emissions in the UK. I will stress as well, though, as you said, down in Cornwall, I mean, like in Cornwall, that's based from granite yeah. emissions. You know, the volcanic rocks are also an extremely good source of radon, but it's also these shales, and that's, the, that's what's more specific, and that's what's going to be more worrying, because the more you disturb these, the more likelihood that the radi radon and other radioactive uh, contaminants in there are going to be liberated. Now, Bear, um, obviously what we see from that map is that we see a sort of a big footprint, radon footprint around the Pennines uh, and not so much across the rest of the, uh, the north of England, although the Boland Shale literally goes from coast to coast. Um, but the Boland sits at a depth of about 5,000 feet. And of course, it's 5,000 feet thick. So the fact that there is 5,000 feet above the shale would obviously limit the, um, the natural uh, migration of radon. But of course, by uh, tapping into that massive shale play, and as we've said before, the Boland Shale is quite possibly one of the most significant deposits of shale on the planet, mm. primarily because it is 5,000 feet thick. So once you're drilling multiple wells into that, then of course what you're doing is you're effectively providing a means by which the radon can escape. Well, that's exactly right, Ian. I mean, it, this is the thing that um, methane has been shown to, you know, potentially migrate through these wells, which means as radon makes up part of methane, that will have moved through. You know, th this is the danger is that the, the, these potential migration pathways are going to be effective for fracking fluids. Yep. So all the horrendous chemicals that come with that, methane and radon, you know, that this isn't just one problem, one part of the industry. There are so many different facets that haven't been studied and potentially can cause problems and do appear to be causing problems. I mean, th there has been found to be a marked increase from one study in the US of radon in wells close to hydraulic fracturing. And this has actually been, um, th th this has been cited on the um, pro-fracking lobby because they say there's not been any proof that there's a direct link 
between these activities, I was gobsmacked to find out that this study was commissioned in 1992 with no original baseline information. So once again, like the air emissions, there's no ability to actually quantify if there is a risk. And this says something about the scientific you know, legislative community of the moment because it's basically the mindset is if there isn't a quantified scientifically proven problem, there isn't a problem. Exactly. Rather than getting the data and actually finding out if there is going to be an issue. They'll just rather, if the, it's the ostrich syndrome, if there's no data, there isn't a problem. Yeah. And, and of course, academia, well, governments and academia, uh, they try and sort of perpetuate this myth that if a statement comes from academia, then it must be true. Um, but of course, as uh, you have proven with uh, your research over the past two weeks, that academia actually relies on... Um, information that it doesn't actually look to verify anyway. Provided a, another academic wrote it, then they simply accept it de facto at face value. Um, and it's, I'm not, I don't want to go into the subject in too much depth, but of course this is the mess that the, um, the climate scientists got themselves into by literally uh, just having a small couple of scientists and they were literally all feeding each other with the desired output. Oh, totally, yeah, totally. A, a, perfect, a perfect example of academic circles. I mean, it, it, you have cliques, you have groups who form, and it's like-minded individuals. And as a result, a, a lot of the time, that there isn't any fair or independent studies done because, as you say, people are trying to twist the results, fit the data to their perceived models. And often or not, that creates spurious results and leads people into, you know, I mean, it, it discredits so many studies that are done on the same topic with fair and open data. Uh, absolutely. So, Bear, um, you know, that's a fantastic um, uh, synopsis of the uh, radon situation. Uh, not one, of course, that is brought into the mainstream by either the uh, British government, the media, or, of course, the industry, but nonetheless a, a very significant issue. So, you know, thank you so much for putting that into the, into the public domain. Um, and, and I can absolutely categorically assure you that it's uh, an issue that I should be incorporating into my presentations. And um, I, I'm looking to do a whole series of presentations now around the country. Um, I'm going to be starting in Chawton. Here we go. Here's the, uh, here's the ad for uh, the flyer for the event mm -hmm. in Chawton. This is at the Irish Club. Um, in Chawton on Wednesday, the uh, 26th of February. Um, and like I said, I'm down in Ammonford in, uh, in South Wales on the 14th of March, I believe it is. Um, and so if you're interested in attending one of these presentations, then details are on my website, which is uh, ianrcrane.com. And they will also be posted on Facebook. And please don't forget to come on to the Fracking Nightmare Facebook page where a lot of the information that uh, we discuss on these programs is posted as a repository for people to review. And also frackingnightmare.com, the website. And you know, one of the most significant um, additions to the frackingnightmare.com website is this phenomenal database. It's an Excel spreadsheet uh, which lists some 960 plus chemicals that have been identified as being used in the hydraulic fracturing process in the US. This is primarily the work of a wonderful researcher by the name of Dr. Theo Colborn. And she has uh, devoted her the last decade and a half or so of her life to the study of endocrine disrupting chemicals in the public domain. And um, uh, this is her work. She's uh, provided it uh, for free. She wants the information out there. And uh, guess what? The authorities in this country are just not interested. They didn't <laughs> compile it, so therefore they're not going to take a look at it. You know, Bear, where we're heading here is that, uh, you know, thankfully, the increasing level of awareness of this issue around the country, the increasing number of anti-fracking groups, all operating autonomously, independently, but networking, sharing information, sharing insights, is literally creating a situation that we have never seen before where the general populace literally has a higher level of awareness and understanding than those who work in this industry.
Oh, yeah, I, I can totally agree. I think in many cases, one of the problems with working in the oil industry is that it blinkers you because, I mean, I, I went to um, a supposedly unbiased um, lecture in Derby University last week. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, regard, from several, there was somebody from the industry there and there was a couple of academics. Um, what was more interesting, um, one, the fact that my question that I asked was completely ignored by the academics um, at the end of it, but also a lot of the students there immediately were, even though they were at the talk, they were not willing to really even engage about any of the potential um, hazards or negative impacts of fracking. They were totally sold on the need for it, the fact that we need this as an energy source and that there is no other alternative. And regardless of the risks, and, and it reminds me of the, you know, the infamous question that I asked uh, Dave Kerr, uh, the IGAS um, projects manager at uh, a public meeting that they held in a room 12 foot by 12 foot. Obviously, they weren't expecting um, you know, too many people to come along. It was a boxing exercise. Yeah. But when I asked him and I said, you know, Dave, have you actually looked at the magnitude of the impact of the contamination? of the negative health impacts on the population in those areas. And his response was truly staggering. He, he simply said, Ian, that's not our responsibility. <laughs> you know, it beggars belief. It really does. It just, I, 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 for me, I cannot understand how anybody potentially who can create a hazard to public health is not immediately mandated to have a duty of care and responsibility to understand and investigate the full ramifications of what of the harm their industry can have on a local community. Uh, you, you've mentioned cognitive dissidence before. This is, is its highest level because they're supposedly there to benefit the local communities, reduce energy prices, which is a lie in itself, and invest money. And all they're going to be doing is uh, severe detriment to the local community's standard and quality of living and, and have such a negative impact, they'll probably have such a great impact long after these, industry, these uh, companies have gone bust and bankrupt. Well, fortunately, the more astute local authorities are beginning to realise that uh, the magnitude of the bribery um, is, is not being offered for nothing. I mean, it's like Josh Fox, you know, when he was motivated to do some research which resulted in the film Gasland, and, um, you know, that was because Josh was offered £100,000, uh, sorry, $100,000 uh, by um, a gas company for open access onto his uh, ranch. And being a smart lad, he realised that there was no such thing as a free $100,000. Uh, and, of course, uh, you know, what he discovered in his research truly shocked him. And, and hopefully, you know, there will be councillors um, all around the country who will make the connection that for this level of bribery to be offered by a central government, there's got to be a catch. And it's not going to take them very long to find out what that catch is. All we ask is that they do some uh, research for themselves. And, you know, I said it last week, and I'm going to say it every week. If I was in David Cameron's shoes, I'd be asking my advisors for an exit strategy. Because as awareness arises throughout the country, then the reality is that David Cameron is not going to be able to force this agenda as we see multiple Barton Mosses springing up around the country. Can you not hear me, Ben? I agree totally. Okay. Unfortunately, just, just, sorry, just saying, I, I, unfortunately, I seem to have lost the connection here. I can't really understand what you're saying, I'm afraid. As far as I got it, it was about the exit strategy from Cameron. And I'll just say, and I think from the Frackland thing, I completely agree with everything you just said, if I understood what you just said. I think you came close. OK, Bear, on the basis that we're starting to lose the connection, thank you so much for joining us again tonight. Um, obviously, we look forward to hooking up with you again next week so that you can share your insights. Meanwhile, once again, as with Humanity versus Insanity, these programmes are not intended for the converted choir. The whole idea of these programmes is to stimulate curiosity across the wider community. So please help us do that. We know that Google are doing everything they possibly can to hide these programmes. We know that the numbers of people viewing are being manipulated by Google. We have literally had accounts of the numbers going down whilst people are watching. It's up to all of us. We all have to get behind this cause if we are going to prevent this industry from 
being unleashed in this country and condemning future generations to lives of absolute abject misery. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Look forward to seeing you next week for episode 16. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.